Hi, and welcome to our post-election conversation. This is part of our Biola commitment to embrace winsome conviction. This is all the more important when divisiveness increases and the gap widens between those on one side and those on the other. And there's no doubt this election has surfaced some divisive attitudes. Elections always do, but, but this one seemed more charged than others. Tonight, some of you who are watching, and perhaps some of you on this panel, were relieved when news outlets announced the election outcome Saturday and the pronouncement of Joe Biden as president-elect. It gives you hope for the future. Others of you were dismayed, and, and this week you are more concerned about where things are heading than you were a week ago on election day. I've come to know one of our journalism graduates Katie Watson, a correspondent with CBS News Digital, and she's assigned to cover the White House. She is front and center. And last week, in the heat of election noise, she tweeted, simply but appropriately, quote, democracy is messy, but boy, are we blessed to live in a country with free and fair elections where the people get their say, end quote. I agree with Katie, as this is a great nation with a long history of a healthy democracy. And tonight, we get to enjoy a further freedom, the freedom to express ideas openly and, and even disagree. Remember, we need to be vigorous in defending our ideas, putting forth the strongest arguments. But as I've often said, you, you don't beat an idea by beating a person. You beat an idea by beating an idea. The title of our event tonight is taken from the words of Abraham Lincoln. 155 years ago, as our nation's terrible civil war was nearing its end, President Lincoln made his second inaugural address. And he ended with these words, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. This passage begins with four words that are worth repeating. With malice toward none. Too many have forgotten Lincoln's words. Maybe when he spoke these words, he had in mind a verse like 1 Peter 2, 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Earlier in that same speech, he, he remarked of the Civil War combatants on either side that both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. Four years prior to that speech in his first inaugural address, trying desperately to hold the nation together, Abraham Lincoln closed with these words. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely as they will be by the better angels of our nature. We are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. This is the time for our better angels to emerge. As Christians, we should embrace from truth news that reflects reality. As Christians, we should come to prudent conclusions, avoiding contemptuous thoughts and language. In contrast to those earthly inclinations, says James, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Finally, I want to acknowledge that there are complicated reasons why people vote the way they do. So let's resist the urge to make generalizations or to label others. Let's respect one another's freedom of conscience, and let's embrace the way of kindness. Those who know me well understand that I tend to talk a lot about kindness. The great American novelist Henry James, son of a theologian, said this, three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind, the second is to be kind, and the third is to be kind. We have the opportunity, and I would argue the responsibility, to model what it looks like to embrace deep biblical thinking and Christ-like kindness. 
We can be that fragrant aroma of Jesus in a society too often polarized and tribal. This past Saturday, this the same day the election results were called, came the death of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who has counseled that we must resist the urge to divide people into the unimpeachably good and the irredeemably bad. Bio's friend Russell Moore recently put it this way, in this sort of politically polarized era, it is easy to hope for total victory for one's own side, whatever that is, and for total defeat for one's enemies, whoever those turn out to be. This sort of mindset is not for those of us who are belong to Christ. That's because the gospel reframes for us both what's at stake and what's not in civic government. So thank you for attending tonight's conversation with malice toward none. And however you lean politically, may you be part of a unifying trend in which we live into our gospel centeredness and proclaim the truth and grace of Christ. Thank you, President Corey. Hi, and welcome to our post. Oh, thank you. Well, welcome again, President Corey. Thank you for fitting in another Zoom meeting into your busy <laughs> schedules. My name is Tim Muehlhoff. I'm a professor of communication here at Biola, and I'm also the co-director of the Winsome Conviction Project. And we are so thrilled to be able to host this conversation tonight. I know you've heard a lot about the Winston Conviction Project, but it occurred to me that maybe you've never heard our vision statement. So let me read it to you. Our vision is to foster conversations within the church and the broader culture that deepen relationships, help to heal a fractured church, foster civility, bring compassion to a warring public square, and enrich the lives of listeners rather than tear people apart. We feel that America today is in a crisis, and it's a crisis on the relational level. There's two parts of communication, our content, which is our arguments, but the relational level is the amount of respect, kindness, and compassion between two individuals. We're committed to trying to make a difference, taking biblical values out to not only fellow Christians, but also to those outside the Christian community. As we speak right now, there are 20 communication majors that have been spending the entire semester not just learning about comm theory, but next week they are going to moderate conversations much like the one that you're going to see tonight. They're doing with friends, coworkers, family members, fellow church members via Zoom, but they have learned the winsome conviction method combined with communication theory and then next week, they're playing with live ammunition. They're going to be hosting conversations where they try to uh, provoke civility among individuals. We've recently been approached by two church leaders uh, who don't see eye to eye when it comes to issues of race. They've asked us to help moderate an understanding between them. It'll always be confidential, but we're excited that now church leadership is starting to recognize the value of civility. And we're thrilled that we're being contacted by Christian high schools. We believe that things will really change in the argument culture when the upcoming generation seeks to speak to each other with civility and compassion. So we're excited that we can be a resource to fellow Christian high schools. We're so glad that you're going to be a part of this. Thank you to our panelists. But let me turn it over now to my co-director, Dr. Rick Langer. Rick? Well, it was almost a year ago that we began having conversations about the uh, 2020 election cycle here at Biola. And they weren't conversations about the outcome of the election, but rather the atmosphere of our community during that time. Would Biola be a shalom-filled place in the fall of 2020? Or would it be a contentious and divisive and, and well, hurtful place? And those concerns weren't entirely hypothetical. Many of us were remembering conversations we had had back in 2016. And what really struck us was how easy it was for unintentional hurt to take place in the countless daily conversations we had with one another. Um, we had those who were rejoicing and we had those who were weeping, but we didn't always take the time to figure out which one of the two we were talking to when we sat down for lunch or entered into a business meeting to chat with one another. And we realized we probably needed to be a little bit more intentional in 2020. 
So back in February, Tim Muehlhoff and I did a chapel, uh, in, in, you know, here back in the days when we had live chapel with human beings. We followed up with a human being filled fireside chat. And uh, we talked to some students about their experience. I had about 20 students there, and they were just talking about their experiences in, in 2016 and some of the things that they, they experienced, some of the fears that they had in light of that for 2020. But we also asked them to share a dream for the 2020 election cycle. And I'd just like to share a little sample of some of the things that those students said. One said, I have a dream that we can make a safe space for having conversations and you know, and you would be able to know that you weren't going to be made into a hashtag. Another said, I have a dream that we could step outside of our parties and we could listen to the other side or even speak on their behalf when we hear others misrepresent them. Another said, I have a dream that we could achieve what Ginsburg and Scalia did. We had talked about our two Supreme Court justices at the time who uh, harshly disagreed on many issues, but at the same time sustained a very close personal friendship, even vacation together as families through the course of time. And we thought that was a wonderful model. Um, another person said uh, that they had a dream that her individual story could be heard and respected and not just reduced to a talking point in a political debate. Um, some great thoughts. And also in the course of that time, we discovered that Sandy Huff and her team were busy at work on all kinds of things that we wanted to do with our students during that time. And we joined in with them and we had a whole pile of these conversations even on through COVID through the course of the summer. And then of course the summer also brought the uh, tragic killing of George Floyd and we entered into a rather tumultuous summer of soul searching, protest, anger, and lament for the ongoing challenge of race relationships in America. It was quite a summer. Um, but as we returned to the fall, not to campus, but to classes and all those other things, um, we realized that all of the concerns we had have really just deepened. All of the things that had gone on in the summer made it more important for us to kind of lean into the challenges we're facing. So we had many, many activities over the course of the fall uh, sponsored by, well, almost every facet of the Biola community. I can't take the time to name all of those, but I do want to thank the community engagement team that Sandy Huff pulled together who were instrumental in implementing all these different activities and working together to keep things kind of on the same page. So I, I really want to give a shout out to all of them. So that brings us to tonight, which is really an event to kind of close out the things we're doing over this election season. We wanted to have a post-election event for the whole Biola community, and we decided to attach that event to a larger kind of a national thing that is going on with a group called Braver Angels. And Braver Angels is seeking to depolarize uh, American public discourse. And I've been volunteering with them for uh, several years now. And uh, they decided to encourage uh, countrywide, uh, all across the nation, events in community groups, uh, colleges and universities, churches, uh, and just have times that uh, we got together in a what they called a with malice towards none event that would seek to foster mutual understanding and bridge building. Uh, across the divides that seem to separate. So we just thought, hey, let's join in with that. So tonight we're gonna do that process. We thought we'd have a conversation with faculty leaders on campus to discuss a little bit of how they're processing the, uh, the election. And so without further ado, let me turn things over to Mike Ahn, who'll be helping introduce all of our panelists. All right. Hey, welcome everyone again. I think and I suspect that you're joining us because you love Biola just like the panelists, and you believe in what Biola is about, about impacting the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so our goal today, our goal tonight, is simple but profound. Instead of letting platforms inform the gospel, we want to, let the, we want to put the gospel first. We're not here to debate conservative versus progressive ideologies necessarily, but we want to model a civil discussion where people are coming from different perspectives. We're not here to belittle the other side but we want to humanize each other and listen well. So this is how it's going to work. I've got a few questions for the panelists, and they're going to take turns answering these questions. But honestly, we really want to hear your questions. So we want to, we want to invite you guys to text in these questions, put them in the YouTube comment box below, and we're going to get to as many as possible. So I'm going to let our panel introduce themselves. And panel, as you guys do, please tell us your name, your title, and if you were distressed or delighted or where you felt in between about the election results. Dr. Augustine, why don't you start? Thank you so much, Mike. So hello, everybody. My name is Walter Augustine, and I serve as the Director of Intercultural Education and Research in our Division of Diversity and Inclusion at Biola. 
but I also serve as adjunct faculty at Talbot School of Theology. And in terms of the election, um, I would say that I am in between. I, I think conflicted might be the best term for me. And the reason why I say that is uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, in terms of the outcome, I really don't feel like we have a full outcome yet, number one. Uh, and also, number two, uh, while I might be somewhat uh, slightly relieved by the outcome, for myself, I really don't see the president as being uh, or that role as being sort of a, a, a savior role, if you would, uh, for me in, in any way. But then on the other side, I would also say this, is that I'm distressed. And um, I would say that I'm distressed for two reasons. One, uh, because the election for me has shown a deep divide within our nation, and I'm distressed by that deep divide. But then number two, and even more importantly for me, is that this election has shown a deep divide within the body of Christ and within the church. And that distresses me greatly as well. Okay, my name is Greg Gansel. Um, I teach philosophy at Talbot School of Theology. And um, I was thinking about the word conflicted also. I do have to say that I, I am more pleased than displeased with the outcome, but I'm very concerned about the division in the country and even more concerned about the division in the church, where it may seem that our allegiances are um, out of order. My name is Karen Godwin, and I am serving this year as our Student Government Association's president. Um, I tried to think what word I would describe my feelings with, but the only two which come to mind are intrigued and baffled. Um, this is my first time voting in a larger election. And so as a first time voter, I mean, this is kind of a crazy election to be voting in, um, it feels like. And yeah, I think with sort of the uncertainty almost that it feels like the results of this election have around it. I think I am just intrigued to see how this week and the next few months continue on. Hi, my name is Christina Lee Kim and I teach in the psychology department here at Biola. And uh, the word I would use to describe how I feel about the outcome of the election, um, maybe slightly relieved, um, and probably more so a little disheartened, I think overall, just <clears throat> by how much division our uh, country and our uh, church community, um, and even here within Biola, uh, the divisions that we're facing. Hi, I'm Scott Waller. I'm in the political science department. And uh, I think the word that I would describe that aptly uh, describes my sort of condition of my soul is tired. I mean, for, for those of us who follow the world of American politics on a full-time basis, um, it has, it has uh, started for us uh, two years ago. And um, so we're weary in a, in a certain regard. So relieved in some sense that, that it's over. Um, but I think overall, I think my feeling would be distressed, um, not only in terms of where I think the policy directions of the new administration may go, but distressed as as to whoever emerges as the, the as the new president, be it Joe Biden or a second term of Donald Trump, um, that neither will possess full legitimacy. I think in the eyes of their opponents, mm -hmm. um, that if Joe Biden emerges um, as the as the president elect here in the days to come, um, that there will be 70 million people or a large percentage of them that have suspicions of his legitimacy, and if Donald Trump uh, somehow emerges from the process. Yeah. Um, there will be at least an equal, if maybe not greater, number of people who find him illegitimate. And that's uh, that's not good for a healthy democracy. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. And, you know, one thing you guys all touched on was the division that we feel on campus or in our churches and our communities. I'd love for you to share one experience um, from this past election cycle about how you experienced that division, whether it was with your family or some, some relationship maybe in your communities. What is one place where you experienced that division? Oh gosh, <clears throat> I'll start here. Um, I think 
you know what? Let's just bring it close to home. I think I've experienced it here at Biola. Hmm. Um, definitely experienced division in this election season, but it's been a division for the past four or five years, honestly, um, even in the 2016 election season leading up to when Trump was elected, there was a stark division. And in my experience, that division has only widened and grown during the past four years. And I see it probably the most blatantly on social media where, you know, maybe that's to be expected. But what saddened me is that I also see it in the church and here in the community at Biola. And, and more specifically, I would say, you know, the political divisions, the ideological decision divisions, um, making assumptions about people and running with those assumptions as opposed to genuinely seeking to get to know people in our differences. Um, and I want to make a distinction between political and ideological divisions versus political and ideological diversity, mm -hmm. which the diversity part, I think, is, is good. It's, it's it, to be expected and valued at an institute for higher education. But somehow this diversity, rather than being valued, is leading to um, division, distrust, mm -hmm. devaluation, and it's threatening the sense of unity and common purpose and mission here at Biola. And if we don't address it, um, it's not going to be good. We have we have to address it. And I guess that's why I appreciate events like this, where it's really seeking to bring people together uh, so that we can listen to, get to one another. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I think for myself, um, in terms of where I've seen this division, um, I personally haven't seen it. I'm, I'm not on social media very much. Uh, so, but where I have seen it is with our students. And so that uh, is something that has really stuck out to me. Um, I, I had a conversation not too long ago with an international student who uh, comes from a country that is a very Christian country. And this student remarked that as they were coming to the United States, they had in their mind basically had been taught that the church in the United States um, was a model of what Christianity should be, mm -hmm. that the church in the United States would model harmony and unity. Uh, but yet when they got here, um, they saw that the church was divided, um, that the church had uh, fighting within um, and uh, had a lot of division going on. And so this student is, is now just very uh, perplexed and distressed uh, with what they're seeing because they thought that coming to the United States, they would see a model of what the church should be. But as they're coming into this time of election, they're seeing the divisions that are existing in the church just as they are in society. So I think that's one place that has stuck out to me. Thank you. Maybe one more person. That's okay. We don't have to. Well, I have another question, though. Uh, the other, another question is, you know what? We, we, we definitely feel these divisions, right? But what uh, brings us together is our common faith in Christ. You know, I'd love to hear how your faith has, has guided you in this political season and how that has informed even some of your understanding of the events in 2020. Dr. Gansel, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think my faith has, has um, brought um, a conflicted journey uh, mm. in this election cycle for me because there have been certain things that have always been very important um, as I've assessed political policy and things. And I began to realize that all of those things are still on my list of important things. But one thing that crept to the top that determined, um, that literally determined how I voted mm -hmm. was, uh, is the progress of the gospel. Mm -hmm. and, and I worked on secular college campuses for 36 years before I got out here. And I'm convinced that the greatest obstacle to the progress of the gospel in these campuses is the perceived allegiance of evangelicalism with Trump. Whether the perception is accurate or not is um, something that could be investigated. Um, but that, per that perception has turned, a, a, I think, a whole generation of young people away from the gospel. And, and, and to me, that became the most important 
issue. Um, to, to take the first steps in um, separating the church in the eyes of the unchurched from um, partisan politics. To me, that's, that has to be priority one, or we're going to lose a generation. And, and they won't, they'll never hear the gospel as good news if they think it's tangled up in the way that they now think it's tangled up. Yeah. Thank you for your reflection. Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I'll jump in on that. And, and Greg and I both share a, um, a passion for the gospel. Both of us served in a parachurch ministry whose, whose primary mission was to, to share the gospel. Um, in answer to your question, though, Mike, um, how has my faith framed my view of uh, political issues and events? And I, I, would, I would say that my faith informs me of truth and reality. It really doesn't surprise me that uh, most non-Christian students on university campuses would look at evangelicals um, in, a, in a kind of odd sort of way. It may be that, that evangelicals are informed by their, by their faith in terms of the nature of what a human person is, what would promote human flourishing. And that may drive uh, 70, 80% of evangelicals to support a candidate whose policy positions they see as more in line with those kinds of um, dictates that come from the faith. Um, I do share Dr. Gansel's concern about the, the propagation of the gospel, and, and uh, uh, I grieve that, that he may be onto something in terms of that being an issue as an impediment to the gospel, but um, I think in terms of the, the more fundamental answer to your question and faith framing our political views, um, Christianity posits itself as describing the world as we experience it, and um, I think particularly in the world of politics and Christian informed politics, I think uh, truth trumps in that regard. Hmm. Nice, nice trump there, I guess. That's, yeah. Anybody else want to share? Okay. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah. Um, I think my perspective of, or how my faith has framed my view of political issues um, and events of 2020 specifically, especially in such a polarized season, um, what I've felt like I've had to do over the past couple of um, weeks and months is refocus on um, different people in the political spectrum and recognize, okay, like I might not agree with this person and their policies. Um, and there are steps that I can take to voice that um, in the political world, but that doesn't mean that I um, disregard that they are a person who has been created by an all-knowing God mm. uh, and that they are loved by that all-knowing God. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's been, at times it's even taxing emotionally to um, think about people that I disagree with and think, okay, these are people that are loved. I might not personally feel that love at this time, mm. but these are people that are loved and created by God. Um, and I think that has also flowed into um, just how I interact with um, things that I want to see happen in our society and our political world um, is I recognize that I can't idolize these people um, because as they are loved by God, just as I am loved by God, they are also fallen people before God, as I am a fallen person before God. Um, and so I think even my faith has pushed me to seek um, ways that I can be engaging in my community um, and helping out in any area that I feel particularly called to. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Okay. Dr. Kim? Um, you know that question that how has faith framed your view of the political issues? I think more than ever, I've felt so politically homeless. I mean, I was never super into politics before, mm. but I think just more in the recent times. Um, and I don't know that that's a bad thing, because um, I, I don't think that either party fully encompasses all of what I believe God asks us to do as believers. And it's a reminder to me that our citizenship is not of this world, but of God's kingdom. And so I think what I've used to try and ground myself is <clears throat> to remember, okay, what is it that God desires of us? Um, and, and that's to be 
to be faithful to obey his commands. And what are his commands? To love him with all his heart, all my heart, soul, mind, to love my neighbor as myself. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just kind of, that's been helpful for me to just try and ground me. Um, and especially in such divisive times, I just remember uh, praying so many times, like right after Trump was elected, um, what am I supposed to do, God? Like, like, what am I supposed to do with the, the turmoil <laughs> that I'm experiencing internally? Um, and I actually kept coming back to um, Romans, Romans chapter 12. And w- in the second half of the chapter, when it talks about the marks of a true Christian, it says, you know, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what's good and outdo one another and showing honor and rejoice and hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. And then bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse and rejoice with those who weep. And I mean, rejoice and weep with those who weep and never be wise in your own sight and um, try to live peaceably with all. And um, basically don't overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And and I think those words really kind of are the, are the things that I, I'm hanging on to. And I'm finding, even though this election turned out in a way where um, I, I am, if, you know, if, if Trump's going to be out of office, I'm relieved by that. Um, it's not that I'm celebrating Joe Biden's presidency, but I am relieved if Trump's going to be out of office. Um, but I find myself holding on to those words still. Those words don't change no matter what the outcome are, uh, what the outcome is. And so um, I think that's something that I've been holding on to, my faith and how that's informing how I'm looking at these things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I'm sorry. I was just going to jump in no, real please. quick. Actually, uh, Dr. Kim stole a lot of what I wanted to say, but which was wonderful. Thank you for saying that. Uh, but uh, just a, a couple of additional thoughts um, in, in terms of uh, even building on what Dr. Kim shared. Um, I mentioned earlier that for me, president is not a savior. And that's one of the mindsets that I, I had to take on. As, as Dr. Kim mentioned, Paul talks about the fact that our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. Mm-hmm. And so that helps me to put things in perspective, mm-hmm. to know that regardless of who wins or who loses, um, that person who is in, sitting in that office is not going to be the salvation of myself or of this nation. Uh, but then the second thing also, Dr. Kim mentioned the, the, the two love commands, and those are really crucial for me as well um, with regards to how my faith informs uh, how I think about a lot of these things. Uh, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And the one piece that I, I would just say about that uh, is that for me, it is not an either or. It is a both and. And I think sometimes we try to rank them and say loving God comes first, then loving neighbor. But I think scripture actually says, no, you can't separate the one from the other. And so for me, I look at policies, I look at candidates through the lens of both of those in terms of which of the policies or which of the candidates um, are going to be more likely um, in terms of loving God and in terms of loving neighbor. Loving God being, of course, morality, um, socialist, you know, sort of social morality, but then also loving neighbor in terms of human flourishing. And so I tend to look through that lens, recognizing, as many of our other panelists have said, no candidate fits that whole model. But uh, that is a, a large part of how faith has informed my uh, thoughts in terms of this uh, political cycle as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know, I, what I'm struck by is, as you guys all shared, is that there's so much hope in our faith. And there's so much hope that we have because, uh, because Jesus is real and he's our king. Uh, with that, I'd love to hear maybe one instance where you saw or you experienced someone um, creating a bridge. You know, sometimes it's hard to experience uh, a unified front because everything feels so polarized. How have you experienced bridge building? Maybe as someone who's on the other side of the political aisle from you. But how did how have you experienced that? And maybe Dr. Waller, we could start with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's a good question. I, I uh, as I reflect on that, I think that I, I think back to a couple encounters I had with some with some folks that that I suspected thought. Uh, very differently than I did politically on some issues. But the thing that was kind of impressive and that really kind of helped uh, build a bridge and, and produced kind of fruitful conversations with that was that that person reflected a kind of 
uh, an epistemic humility, that they, they didn't come to the conversation, that they knew everything, that they uh, took a posture of curiosity about perhaps my mind on some issues, that um, they, they weren't so quick to reveal what they thought, but they were more curious about what I thought. And, and, and it was genuine. They, they actually wanted to, to maybe learn something that um, uh, they, might be, they might be wrong. Uh, prior to that conversation, and then and they might um, uh, come to a different conclusion as a result of you know uh, a conversation, and and to reflect that back to them, I think uh, a kind of epistemic humility, not a relativity, but a humility, um, is I think really important in these areas. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump in? I think I, I can say a few things. Um, our, um, uh, we have three grown kids and they are much more progressive than we have ever been. Um, and um, we've had a great time over these last five, six years um, having conversations with them and, and being able to ask, now, can you explain this to me? Hmm. I, you know, why? And, and we'll ask them questions, not just about the progressive side, but about the conservative side. Mm -hmm. So one of my baffling questions is how did uh, global warming become a political issue? It seems like it shouldn't be a political issue. Mm -hmm. And as we talked it out, we realized that, that there's that on one side there, there may be a fear of intrusive government regulation. And that that kind of makes or encourages people on one side to adopt a certain position. And then on the other side, there, there is a, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, um, a um, kind of a, well, because this is Biola, I think it, I, can, I can say it, that, there, that there's a, an environmental worship that's a kind of idolatry. And, um, but to, but, but actually to hash these things out has been um, rich for us. And I've, I've had conversations with a, with a family friend who, who got into such a fight with their daughter that they couldn't speak for weeks. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that's just, that's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've, I've learned a, a lot, both about how to communicate civilly and, and how to ask questions and be curious um, with, my, with my kids. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Anybody else? OK. Well, if not, then I'm going to start asking questions from the audience. And their questions are a lot harder than mine, OK? So here's our first question. It's going to come on the screen. Um, and you guys are going to see it. Here we go. Here's the first question. How do you begin to repair relationships that have been damaged by politics? One more time. How do you begin to repair relationships that have been damaged by politics? Yeah, Dr. Wall. Yeah, can, yeah, could I jump in on that? Actually, it's a nice follow-up to, to Greg's good comments there. Um, you know, for someone who does this sort of on a full-time basis, you know, I show up in the morning at Viola and go home and, and all I do is talk politics it's become increasingly apparent to me that the relationship is more important than, than convincing some of your public policy position, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you're in that, if you're in that uh, relationship for the long haul with people. I think it's better to, um, not in a relativistic way, but, but for the sake of the, of the relationship, to, to let it go. And that there are things, particularly in long haul relationships that are more important than me convincing someone in my, in my life that, that I care more about them as a person than their political views. Um, and just, just developing the discipline of letting it go, just letting it go. Yeah, that is, that is hard. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? I would say um, something that's been helpful for me to hang on to is always recognizing that a political view is formed by the, the experiences, you know, education, information, um, even the absence of experiences that a person has had uh, up until that point in their life. So political view doesn't just 
drop out of nowhere. It comes because it's shaped and formed by things that that person has experienced and lived and known and, and um, learned. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really helpful when there's disagreement and differences and even really stark differences to try and return to, wow, what are the things that have shaped this person's life to kind of help lead them to arrive at this point in time? Mm -hmm. And I think getting underneath the actual idea, but to the lived experience of the person um, can help to, to form relationship again, I think. Absolutely. Thank you. Anybody yeah, else? I think yeah. that, can I jump in? Okay. Please. I think that's very helpful. Um, a, a couple of assumptions help me. Um, one is, in a lot of cases, if everyone wrote a list of what's important to them, the lists would include many of the same elements, but they might be ranked in different orders. And then that that's helpful because I, I mm -hmm. it stops me from assuming that someone doesn't care about something. Mm. Um, and then the other assumption is it's helpful for me to make a distinction between means and ends. Mm -hmm. Some disagreements are about what what is the best strategy to get to an end. And it might be that we share the same end more or less, but we disagree about strategies. Mm -hmm. And that I think it's helpful because if we agree about the goal, more or less, if we're close, then a disagreement about a strategy is, is, is much less important. So th those are helpful things. Yeah. Great. Great. I got I got another follow-up question. I mean, we've said some really great words: curiosity, humility, um, letting things go. You know, Dr. Kim talked about empathy and the lived experience of people. Dr. Gansel, you're talking about prioritizing things and understanding means and ends. You know, all of this feels like a robust discussion, not just a simple slogan or a Twitter feed. How do we actually engage in those conversations? It seems like we're actually getting somewhere right now, and we people in America don't get to even this place. What's going on? Well, we don't have the conversation on Facebook or Twitter. I think that's, <laughs> um, well, well, I think one thing is, and this is very hard, is I think I I am primed to come up with a quick answer when someone says something. Um, but a quick answer is very often not helpful. And it's much more helpful if I can help my conversation partner talk more. And, and, and so sometimes saying things like, wow, this seems really important to you. Can you tell me more? Mm -hmm. And, and so then the conversation, you're moving past the slogan. Another good question is, have, have you always thought this way or did something change your mind? Mm -hmm. to, inv to invite the person to go past um, the slogan, uh, for one thing, people don't expect ever to go get past the slogan and we can move a conversation better. So those are some tools that can be helpful. Yeah, thank you. Any other thoughts? Well, Mike, I think, oh, go ahead. No, please. I was just going to say, um, jumping off your point, Dr. Ansel, um, I've found that for me, at least when I have an actual interest in the person that I'm speaking to and a relationship, pursuing a relationship with that person, um, that I'm going to be invested in finding out why do they believe what they believe? Is this something that is just a policy matter to them that they think would be um, important and helpful for our country? Or is this an identity matter? Or is it something else? Like, what is their foundation that they are coming from yeah. when they are approaching an issue? Um, and then obviously I can assess what my foundation is that I am coming from when I'm an, approaching an issue. But if I'm just having this conversation online with someone I don't really know or don't really care to know, then I'm going to be invested in um, telling them why I am right. Um, and I don't, when there's no relationship between people and they're trying to have um, 
important discussions and don't even know where each other stand, um, I think that's when things become counterproductive. Thanks, Karen. Anybody else? Dr. Waller, did you want to jump in? or? Yeah, um, I, I think it's been my experience that um, people who can have civil conversations um, do that out of a sense of confidence that, and not out of insecurity. Mm. Um, uh, incivility oftentimes comes from people um, who buy into things at the level of slogans. Um, the health of democracy is the health of the of the substance of its citizens. And I think part of the, 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 the inherent conflictual nature of what we're seeing in American politics is a function of the unhealth of our democracy in terms of the, uh, the being informed on behalf of its citizens. Um, being, being involved in politics and casting a vote is more than just a sentiment. Um, it's a reflection of your informed mind of where you think things ought to go. And, and you know, and, uh, as we met as a group earlier this week, um, a lot of the uh, focus of tonight is on a kind of psychological, effective, um, affective, uh, relational and, and clearly in, in important topics. But in the world of politics, um, we're, we're hurly burly in the world of ideas and and policy. And um, the most loving and perhaps compassionate thing I could do with someone in a civil manner um, is to is to seek to correct them from error. Um, in doing that, though, we we engage people at the level of ideas and not attack their person. And I'm much more uh, able to do that um, and be civil toward one uh, out of a firm conviction. And and you know the the very focus of tonight is is words from Lincoln's second inaugural address. Mm -hmm. um, do you think at the end of a four year bloody civil war, Abraham Lincoln was ambivalent about the rightness of his cause, mm -hmm. um, and that 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 he was willing to extend that uh, to people who would eventually kill him in the not too distant future, mm -hmm. uh, because he was confident that on the question of the moral uh, issue of slavery, he was quite convinced that his position was true. Mm -hmm. And I think out of that stemmed his um, admonition for malice toward none. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Mike, if I could just add one other piece, and, and I think that um, this pertains in general to society in general as we're trying to repair uh, relationships, but I think it specifically applies to believers, and I think about this even at Biola. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that we need to, as we think about this, we, we need to reframe our posture um, and our, our worldview almost. Um, and here's what I mean. Martin Luther King said this. Um, he said, um, we are bound together uh, in an inescapable uh, garment of destiny, um, tied together in mutuality. And so he said, essentially, I can't be all that I should be until you are all that you ought to be. And you can't be all that you ought to be until I am all that I ought to be. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, he said, we, there is interrelatedness between us. I think that even as we think about how do we repair these relationships, we need to start with thinking about um, relationship, right? Just the, the concept of relationship that we are tied together. And I think this is even more so true for those who are believers, those who are at Biola. Um, there's a saying I like to say sometimes, I, you know, people said blood is thicker than water, um, but I would argue that spirit, being Holy Spirit, is thicker than blood. And so we are in relationship with one another, whether we like it or not, um, which means relationship means that we, we have to, right? It, this, is, this is not voluntary. This becomes something that we are called to do, uh, which is unity amidst our diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, last quick thought on that. So my wife and I, we are in relationship. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't disagree, that we don't fight. But one of the things we do when we come into disagreement, we have an understanding that we are in relationship for life. Mm -hmm. So we enter into the space saying, I'm not going anywhere. And she says, I'm not going anywhere. And so then we say, OK, well, we better figure this thing out then. And so I think if that's true for my wife and us, 
Um, that's even more so true for the body of Christ and for the people of God because we're together for each other. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to say something to try to bring Walt what you're saying and what Scott is saying together because I think it's I think um, they complement each other very well. Um, one of the challenges of our political divide is um, especially on a campus like Biola is that um, our students have been raised in a culture where disagreement is the enemy. Hmm. And so it's all about placating feelings. And, and so, so I, I, I think this, this, the means of communication has to be love. But the, and I think you're both kind of saying this uh, from different sides, mm -hmm. but the, but there has to be room for real disagreement. And, and I think it's incumbent on us as faculty to begin retraining our students that disagreement is not disrespect. In fact, it's a sign of respect, hmm. right? If I can articulate a disagreement with you, that means I'm taking your view seriously, hmm. not on the level of slogans. Um, Second Timothy, the Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome, but be able to teach. And that, and that carries both of these things, not quarrelsome um, because we are bound in this relationship and we're placed in this new reality of the body of Christ, but able to teach and, and, and to, um, you know, to attempt to correct. I mean, because obviously every one who has a political opinion thinks her political opinion is pretty much correct. Otherwise, they wouldn't have the opinion, right? So, so we 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 welcome um, disagreement, but it's within this context of of relationship. Yeah, yeah. You know, one thing you said there, Dr. Gansel, was that disagreement is the enemy, and a lot of the students feel that. You know, Karen, I'd love to hear what you think about that. You know, being not that you represent all the students, and you know, students aren't all the same, but I'd love to hear what you think about that, and if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, I guess most of my thoughts on that are probably my personal thoughts um, in that I don't know if I necessarily see disagreement as an enemy, mm -hmm. but um, I think certainly when disagreement begins to trample on people's feelings, so it becomes disrespectful, mm -hmm. um, then I and I would venture to say many others um, in my age group would say then that disagreement has crossed a certain line um, which should not have been crossed. Um, so, I mean, I would hope that that points to an empathetic generation that is um, currently in college and coming up. And that's not to say that older generations aren't empathetic, um, but I think with such an age of information that we live in, um, I feel constantly um, aware and I feel like I need to constantly be educating myself on um, what things I might say or opinions I might have that might make someone feel less than me. Great. You know, I want, oh, I, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Kim. Well, I just, I don't know, I have a question, I guess, maybe for, for people in the group. Please. Because um, I, I hear what everyone's saying, and I guess it makes me wonder, is there room for disagreement? in the body of Christ? Um, or is it always something sort of to be tolerated until I can teach you the right way and you're eventually all gonna end up agreeing about something? Hmm. Or is there some value that disagreement could bring? And, and I'm talking about like real disagreement, like, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at a political issue, like, like real disagreement on immigration or on race relations or on whatever. Is there some sort of inherent value that disagreement can bring to our body? Is there room for that? Or is it something just to be tolerated for the sake of relationship? And I think that might be an important question to ask. I love that question. Any Anybody have thoughts? I guess I'll go ahead and jump in uh, real quickly. I, I do feel that there is room for disagreement. 
um, I, I brought the word unity earlier, uh, but one of the things I do want to say about unity is that unity is not uniformity. Uh, unity does not mean that we all uh, you know, think alike, look alike, or vote alike. Um, but uh, unity actually has diversity within it um, coming together. So that means that there's going to be difference, uh, but I think there's also room for disagreement as well. I, but I think also, though, to Karen's point, I think that there is disagreement, but for me, the boundaries of disagreement start coming into play when I bring into thought those two love commands. Um, so when I start thinking about um, those two love commands in the areas in which we disagree, for, for me, it becomes problematic when it starts impacting and affecting the flourishing of others or when it impacts and affects the ability of folks to love God, um, as Greg was sharing before, and Scott propagating the gospel, so on and so forth. So I, I think that there are boundaries for me in terms of disagreement, and those boundaries are the two great love commands. But I would agree with you, Christina, that there is room for disagreement within that. So, so Walt, uh, wouldn't those boundaries be more about how disagreement is carried on than the, than the substance of a, of, of a disagreement? You know, I, I think, Greg, it depends on the this, this subject. Um, so, for instance, and I'll just speak as an African-American man, mm -hmm. having disagreements about slavery, for me, uh, does not feel like a matter of, of how we disagree or how we carry on the disagreement. Mm -hmm. There's a fundamental moral issue at stake there. And so, for me, that's where that boundary comes in, in terms of human flourishing. Now, there are some other areas where I would definitely agree with you that um, you know, there is a, a matter of how we go about disagreeing. But I think there are some matters, at least for, for me, that um, those boundaries come into play. Well, I would agree with you about that. I wasn't thinking about that kind of disagreement, but thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go to a question from one of our audience members. Here's a question, it says this, not looking to advocate for either candidate here, but should we, and more importantly, can we realistically divorce policy and religion or vice versa? Okay, let me read it one more time, just so I get it too, okay? Not looking to advocate for either candidate here, but should we, and more importantly, can we realistically divorce policy and religion or vice versa? I think the assumption here is that policy and religion have been very tied together um, and how do we kind of look at it differently? If anybody wants to look, take a shot at that. Well, I'll, I'll take a shot. Um, it's often said that politics is downstream from culture, and culture is influenced by the, the religiari or the religion of, of the culture. And so some sense, I think the answer to that question is no. In many ways, I think that our that our more secular culture has embraced a new kind of religion, and it does drive uh, public policy positions in certain directions that are very uh, different than perhaps a traditional Judeo-Christian worldview, religion, uh, mindset um, may dictate. So, in some ways, um, I don't think they are, and uh, I think it's a it's a dangerous proposition to to think about uh, divorcing. Uh, those two things, if we are are ready to embrace a kind of anti-intellectualism, mm. the idea that our that our Christian faith really is a kind of uh, side dish, and the smorgasbord is kind of secular thought. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I've seen in in my classrooms students all too willing to embrace as a kind of um, excuse to not think about public policy positions from their Christian worldview, mm -hmm. that they've all been too willing to embrace uh, a separation of church and state. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the common assumption is that the First Amendment to the United States Constitution entails of some kind of virulent separation of church and state that is meant to create a kind of secular public order and our religion is supposed to be sort of off on the private reservation. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think uh, you know, I'm not sure the, the nature of the question. Um, but um, to try to divorce the two worlds um, could lead to some uh, dangerous end. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I really agree with what Scott's saying. I think, um, so suppose you try to think out your public policy and all these complexities from a really rich gospel, theologically rooted worldview. Well, one ingredient of that worldview 
is that God created human beings to flourish, and his revealed truth is the path to flourishing. Mm -hmm. So to, to say that I should not engage in that kind of thinking in order to try to avoid certain kinds of disagreement or a misunderstanding of the Constitution um, is really a failure of the love command. If I love my neighbor, um, it's it's better for my neighbor if he can stay married and doesn't get divorced. It's better for my neighbor if um, there's not violence in the schools. It's better for my neighbor if the schools are really, really helpful mm -hmm. at teaching people who have all kinds of challenges when they walk in the school. And, and, and all of these things flow out of our our sense of God's creation and redemption. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's quite an impoverished vision of human flourishing to try to divorce our, our theology mm -hmm. from it. And, and then we'll have nothing to offer. Great. I'm going to go to another question. Here's another question. I think uh, we can hear this. I'm a Biola student and I'm and one of my friends stated she would not be kind to someone who would vote differently than her. How can I approach her with kindness and with truth? I'll read it one more time. I'm a Biola student, and one of my friends stated she would not be kind to someone who would vote differently than her. How can I approach her with kindness and with truth? Again, I think this feels like a lot of people on social media, if you vote for this person, I can't be your friend. You know, you're not my Facebook friend anymore. Or, you know, um, so, yeah, Dr. Waller. Yeah, I think I'd say that that person's putting the cart before the horse. Um, there's something more important about a person than, than their vote cast. And they might be airness uh, in, in terms of how they cast their vote. And at the end of the day, this, this student might be right, that, that, that the person who votes differently the, for them, than them might vote, vote in an erroneous direction. Mm -hmm. But there's something more fundamentally important about that person than than their uh, voting proclivities or their voting habits or their political proclivities. I think when I hear um, sentiments like that, and I think there is, has been a lot of that in the past couple of years, um, I feel really sad about it. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, I can kind of understand maybe where a person might be coming from. And sometimes, um, you know, people might even use the language of uh, like creating healthy boundaries, um, feeling traumatized by somebody, feeling abused by somebody who has a different view. And I don't want to minimize any of that. But I do think that um, the Bible is clear that we're to love one another, whether they agree with us or they don't. Mm -hmm. And how... How do we do that? I think um, statements like that um, just reveal to me more and more how impossible it is to do that in our own strength. Yeah. Like we really need God's help um, if we are to love people, if we are to love our enemies and even bless those who persecute us. Like that's mm. crazy. Like yeah. in, in today's world, people feel like you're nuts. Right. Like that's, that's ridiculous. Um, and yet that's what God tells us to do. Um, and that's what actually Christ modeled for us on the cross. And so um, in terms of how do you approach that person with kindness? Well, I would say to the student, well, just uh, approach them with kindness um, and with truth. And, and your job is not to convince somebody mm. to do anything, actually. Um, I think God's kindness is what leads us to places of repentance. And when we are kind to others, I think that that um, can be a source of experiencing God's kindness as well. Great. All right. Well, would, yeah, go ahead, Karen. I was just going to really quickly say that I would add on to that, if possible, um, to find out what showing kindness to that person looks like, whether that's they just need someone to listen to them. They haven't had anyone who's willing to hear them out hmm. um, or whether that's, um, yeah, just supporting them, finding out why they feel that way, um, making them feel heard or any other way that you feel showing them kindness would be best. Um, I, I think unless it's regarding like setting boundaries for yourself, because obviously you need to take care of um, 
just your emotional well-being as well. Um, if you are able to, um, to just stick by that person, because if you pull away from them, then it's almost like you're effectively doing the same thing that they are doing to another person. Um, and obviously there are like individual um, situations that go into that. So I would say use your discrepancy with that. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to another question. Uh, here's another question. What is a moment when you've been proud uh, to be, oh, proud of America, proud of the church? One more time. What is a moment when you've been proud of America, proud of the church? And again, I think maybe this question is trying to get back to what are some things that, we, that unite us as Americans? Because again, there's so much division, if I could assume what this person is asking. Yeah. Um, I feel proud of America a lot. Um, yeah. And proud of the church a lot. I mean, I see the, I see it's very popular to look mostly at the, at the failures and the weaknesses. But by and large, I, I, I think the church is, is extraordinary. Um, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, people from all over America went down to help. Most of them came from churches mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's, it's been demonstrated in study after study that, that the more involved in your church, especially conservative evangelical or conservative Catholic churches, the more involved you are in concrete help in your towns and in your cities, the more money you give, um, the, the church is, is extraordinary. And so I'm I'm proud of the church a lot. Great. Thank you. Any other instances? Yeah, I can jump in, Mike, if um, please, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I, I've been most proud of the church when the church is willing, particularly in a in a an increasingly virulent secular culture, mm. um, to pass a test of moral courage. And and Robert George, who's been at Viola on on several occasions has five tests of moral courage and and here they are that that it that one would take a position on an issue and think about how the church might do this that would make them unpopular that in some way they might be loathed and ridiculed by powerful influential in institutions or individuals within society mm -hmm. that in some sense people would eschew them that they would be uh, abandoned that they might be called nasty names that, that in some case, in a, in a personal sense, it might deny people of valuable professional opportunities. I think, the, I think the call of the church in the direction that we see culture going in this more virulent secular direction is going to be our test of moral courage and our conviction to stand on things that might cost us. Hmm. And um, when, when I get concerned about the church is when I, I see people all too willing to bend the knee to cultural currents and not um, give credence to what we ought to give credence to. Clear scriptural dictates on these uh, issues of importance that affect not only us, but um, uh, us as a body, mm -hmm. and uh, to Greg's comment about America, that might lead to the flourishing of the United States of America. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Well, here's, here. okay. All right, well, you know what? What we're gonna do is we're gonna move to um, just a way to kind of close our time and we're gonna give everyone a chance to speak on this. Um, but as we do this, uh, I just wanna thank each of you guys for sharing today and bringing um, your perspectives. It's, it's been a very rich time uh, just to hear where we're coming from and just trying to find places of unity. So thank you for that. Uh, but. If you could share maybe one hope and one fear that you have uh, as you look forward to the next year, next four years even, um, just being in America. What, what is one hope you have? What is one fear you have uh, in the coming weeks, coming months, coming years? So Karen, why don't we start with you? Yeah, um, I would say specifically for the Viola community, I have appreciated during my time as a student, 
the ways that Viola has sought to have students engage in conversation with one another, um, whether that's an event like this or seed symposiums, um, I think Viola has always been committed to being an example of what it means to be a Christian and engage in com loving conversations with one another. So I think a hope that I have um, is that we would continue to be a community that has these conversations mm -hmm. and that we would be a community that learns to love one another like Jesus loved others. Um, so refraining from throwing that first stone, but rather hearing people out um, and inviting others into a loving conversation. Um, I think a fear that I have is that um, we as a community would see our politicians as saviors, as Dr. Augustine said earlier. Um, I think I worry that um, even as politicians come and go through the years that we would hold on to them rather than um, certain policies or certain convictions that we have. Um, so my hope is that we would, yeah, continue to love one another and engage in conversation without um, holding on to politics and politicians as our saviors. Great, anybody else? I guess I'll go ahead and, and jump in uh, real quickly. Sorry, Greg, I didn't mean to <laughs> cut you off there. Um, I, I think for me, uh, my hopes and my fears are two sides of the, the same coin in some respects. Um, so my hope is that we will remember whose we are and who we are. Um, I, 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 and what I mean by that essentially is I hope that we will remember that before we are Americans, before we're anything else, we are children of God and that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, we, we often say, uh, and we talk about this at Biola, that our primary identity is in Christ. Um, that does not mean that our other identities don't matter, but our, we say our primary identity is in Christ. And so if that is the case, I hope that we will remember that um, and that we will live that out um, in its meaning, not just for ourselves individually, but for us collectively as the body of Christ, as the people of God. Uh, second part of that hope then is that um, is this. Um, some of the things we talked about tonight, we talked about a lot about truth, but I want to use another word that we find in scripture that I think is important also, which is command. Um, if we are the body of Christ, if we are the people of God, Jesus has commanded us um, to love the Lord our God with, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, love our neighbor as ourselves. But then he gave a special command, additional command for the church in John and in the, in the Gospel of John, where he says, love one another as I have loved you. Mm -hmm. And so that's my hope, that, that we will truly take that to heart and embody that that we will place our citizenship in heaven, our identity in Christ as primary, um, so that these other issues do not divide us. Uh, we can have disagreement, but uh, not to divide us. Uh, and then my fear is the flip side of that, that we will place our politics before our, our Christian, um, who we are in terms of being a body of Christ, the people of God, um, and that we will allow those to drive our relationships or to divide our relationships with one another. So, so those are my hopes and fears. Thank wow, you. very good. Um, I think my fear, it's easier to start with my fear, I suppose. Um, I, I, I fear that we will never break our addiction to social media and that this is already producing a spirit of hopelessness and cynicism that is going to take a long time to see correction. Hmm. Um, it's a deep concern. It's not just social media, but it's the hopelessness and the cynicism. I do believe that social media is the primary tool of the enemy to bring this spirit upon the world. Um, 
not to be overly dramatic about it. Um, I, and I guess I'm reiterating what I said before, and this connects with what Walter was saying. Um, my, my hope is in the church hmm. because I think, I think, I don't know of a church that's not engaged in their communities. I don't know of a church that um, is serious about helping young people grow into their faith. I don't, you know, I don't know a church that's that's not serious. I should say that that isn't about wrestling with the deep things of God and helping people grow to maturity. And and I think there is more of the fabric of our country that's being held together by the church than anyone can see. So I'm hopeful about the church. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Gansel. Dr. Kim, Dr. Waller. Um, <clears throat> my, I'll start with fear too. That was, that was good. Greg. Uh, my fear is that in this division that we're experiencing, my fear is that we're, we'll just continue to dig our heels deeper into our own sense of rightness rather than taking on a humble posture that we will take on a prideful one. Mm -hmm. um, and my fear is that our hearts will become hard toward one another. Mm -hmm. And because of our lack of love towards one another, other people will not see that we are his disciples. Mm -hmm. Kind of going off of what Walter was saying. That's my fear, but my hope is that actually in the division, uh, it will actually lead us into a deeper dependence upon God and that we'll recognize even more our own brokenness and our great need for a savior. And that this awareness will, not just at an individual level, I really think it's necessary at the individual level, but more so at a corporate level, that it will help believers to come together in, in a spirit of humility and, and repentance, frankly. Um, and in so doing that, our hearts will be reignited for the gospel and we will be better able to love God and love one another. And so that's my hope, my great hope. Thank you. Well, I, I think uh, I'll speak to the fear first. Uh, evangelicals are not known for their longstanding attention in the world of politics, that evangelical attention to politics is about as long as the last election cycle. And, and uh, things are quite amped up right now. And, and, and just I think we're just start, maybe starting to see the, the kind of uh, tamping down of this. Um, and I, I would be concerned that, that, that there are calls for unity right now. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure what kind of unity is called for. If it's, if it's mere sentiment or if it's just too casual or wishy-washy, I'm not, I'm not sure what there is to unify. I do have hope in this though, mm -hmm. that if there's anything that the, this world can unify around, we are the people who can provide that which can uh, provide mm -hmm. unity. Um, you know, I get to teach, I get to teach college students on a day-to-day -day basis, 18 to 22 year olds. And it's a difficult task, um, outside election seasons, particularly to engage college students about things political. And one of the things that really turns American college students, and I suspect around the world off on politics is its conflictual nature. And one of the things that, that I say very early on in a, in a politics course, particularly of an introductory nature is that, that the American constitutional order invites conflict. We have a separation of powers. The most famous Federalist paper there is out there is Federalist 10, which talks about factional conflict, which was the Achilles heel of, of uh, Republican styles of government. So the very art of, and, and task of deliberation requires a kind of conflictualness that we can't be we can't be Pollyannish and we can't be utopians and just sort of accept a kind of sentimental sense of, of unity. But I have great hope that as the church um, um, has the source of that which would provide unity and flourishing and help to people individually and collectively, that we need to show ourselves to be those kinds of people. Thank you. Thank you again, all of you guys. And I am left with the word conflictualness. Someone should start a church plant called Conflictualness Church. That'd be awesome. Well, and, and again, I think what you're getting at is not the either or nature, but the both and nature of what we've been discussing. So thank you for that. Thank you also for processing with us. We're grateful that you joined us. You know, we're going to have another event. And, you know, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Langer, and he's going to help invite you to this event where we want to process with you too. 
Thank you so much, Mike. And I really want to thank all of our panelists as well. Doing things like this is, uh, is not easy, but it's super valuable. And it's very important for us as a community to do it. And I'm really, really grateful for, for Mike on and his leadership in this process and also the participation of all of our panelists. It was almost exactly three years ago today that I was at Duke University for a training in being a moderator for the group called Better Angels at the time, now Braver Angels. And it was a uh, group where people had come from uh, many locations all over the country would come together for kind of a weekend training to do this. And uh, at the beginning of the time, the person who was leading it had everyone go around the room, there's probably 30 or 40 of us, and just share in like 90 seconds why they had uh, come to this, to this training at that time. And I was amazed that basically half of the people in the room basically said some variation on the theme of, Two weeks from now, I'll be having Thanksgiving dinner with the family, and I'm worried about how that conversation would go, and I'd really like some help in navigating the conversations that are going to come up. Um, and it was an interesting testimony to me about how politics is no longer just an external public affair, but often a very private, very personal, very much of a at-home-where-we-live kind of affair. So many of us are motivated to learn some skills for how to have these conversations just a little bit better. So we thought as a good follow-up for the things we were doing tonight, we would offer a workshop tomorrow night for people who'd like to say, hey, how about some practical skills for, for putting this in place? Um, so we'll give you a chance tomorrow night to look at a few tools, uh, have some conversations about different convictions, uh, and hopefully do a little bit of what the book of James calls practicing the wisdom from above, a wisdom that's pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, uh, and impartial and sincere. Wow, what a wonderful way to have a conversation. We'll talk some about those things, and then we'll have a chance to do it. We will uh, cluster people up together in some groups. We'll watch and observe one another, then we'll flip things around. We do what we call a fishbowl exercise. So it'll be kind of an interesting time. Um, if you'd be interested in that, we'd love to have you sign up and join us. It's important that you sign up ahead of time because you want to organize groups in a way that'll make it as easy as possible for people to share with one another. So there should be a link in the chat box that you could follow if you'd like to sign up for that. If you're on campus at Biola active in terms of being uh, you know, faculty, staff, or student, you probably got an email in your inbox that also has a link that's uh, functioning to take you to that. But we'd love to have you sign up ahead of time and join us for that event tomorrow night. It'll be at 7 p.m., not 8 p.m., so we'll be at 7 p.m. and we'll just in, in, have that uh, workshop experience. I think it'll be a great time and we'd love to have you join us for that. So let me take a moment now and just uh, thank God for the time we've had and pray for, uh, for the Biola community and for our nation as we look ahead. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for times like this where we just get to pause and think a little bit about where you have placed us and the time and place you've put us and those who you have put around us. Lord, they are a gift from you to us. Every time we meet our neighbor, our neighbor is an opportunity both first to extend your love for them, but also for you to talk to us, for you to refine us. And Lord, I pray you would help us to savor and treasure those interactions, be it with a neighbor we agree with or a friend we agree with or one we might disagree with. Lord, help us to realize these are all people who are made in your image, and they're also people through whom you work to accomplish our good. Help us, Lord, to be people who join with you in working for the good. And Lord, we pray as well for our nation as a whole. We thank you for the privilege of living in America. We thank you for all of its history, it's sometimes dark and sometimes a shining light. We understand that we are both, uh, as all people are both. And so, Lord, we pray you would help us to be people who move forward, who bring the light forward, uh, who, who shine it brightly. And at the same time, don't shy away from confronting the darkness and the challenges that we honestly face, because we do have these kinds of challenges. And Lord, we pray especially for the Biola community, that we could be a place of shalom, that we could be a place where people can dif dif disagree and differ, at the same time extend authentic love and care for one another. Lord, give us the grace that we might be a faithful witness, that people would see how we treat one another and say, look at how these people love one another. And that as a result of that, you would be honored and glorified in the time and place where you have put us. May you give us that grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us tonight.